In this video, I want to introduce some ideas about functional neuroanatomy. Functional neuroanatomy, or looking at the structure of the nervous system in terms of uh, the functions of the nervous system. Anatomy. Because anatomy means the structures, and neuro refers to the nervous system, and then functional just because I like to first kind of think about the nervous system in terms of the functions that it performs. Now the structure of the nervous system is divided up into two main parts. First is a part called the central nervous system. I'll just write CNS for central nervous system. And that's mostly made up of the brain here inside the head and the spinal cord inside the spine. And we call that part the central nervous system. And the other big division of the structure of the nervous system is called the peripheral nervous system. I'll write PNS for peripheral nervous system. And that's mostly made up of the nerves, which are all these long stringy structures that spread out through all the tissues of the body that are attached to the spinal cord or to parts of the brain. And all that we call the peripheral nervous system. And these nerves contain bundles of neuron axons that connect most of the parts of the body back to the central nervous system. And in the central nervous system, and particularly parts of the brain, more complex processing of information occurs with the very large number of neurons that are up there. Now, if there's dysfunction of parts of the nervous system, let me just write a red X through part of the peripheral nervous system here, or a red X through part of the central nervous system up here. If there are areas of the nervous system that aren't working properly, we can get different patterns of abnormalities of the functions of the nervous system. And those patterns of functional abnormalities we call syndromes. Syndromes. And syndromes involve things that are called symptoms symptoms and or things that are called signs. Now symptoms are mental or physical abnormalities reported by a patient or witnesses, whereas signs is the word we use for mental or physical abnormalities that a clinician finds when they're examining a patient. Now we often use this term lesion, lesion, when we use that term lesion, what we're referring to is the location of dysfunction, in this case in the nervous system, which could be caused by a number of different types of diseases or disorders or pathologies. But the lesion location is usually what determines the syndrome that occurs, the symptoms and signs that can occur with an area of dysfunction. And then the type of disease that's causing the lesion often determines a lot of other things about what's happening to a patient. But before we start talking about syndromes and abnormalities of the functions of the nervous system, first let's just talk about some ways to organize or categorize the functions of the nervous system. So the way I like to think about the functions of the nervous system is first to divide them into two big groups. And I like to call these the lower functions of the nervous system and the higher functions of the nervous system. So for the lower functions of the nervous system, or you could call them the more basic, or some people even say kind of the more physical functions of the nervous system, these are carried out by both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So many parts of the entire nervous system are involved in carrying out these lower neural functions. And I like to divide these up into three big groups. The first group of functions I like to call the sensory functions sensory functions because the nervous system can sense many aspects of the body and the environment. And these sensory and functions include things you typically think of like vision, hearing, smell, and taste, and then things like a sense from the inner ear we call vestibular sense, and multiple senses from the body that we collectively call somatosensation, which include things like the senses of touch, the position of body parts, vibration, pain, temperature, and others. The next group of lower neural functions I like to call the motor functions. Motor. And the word motor in this context refers to control of skeletal muscle contraction. And skeletal muscle is the main muscle type that's all over our body, mostly attached to our skeleton. And by controlling skeletal muscle contraction, the nervous system controls movement and then things like tone and posture when we're not moving. 
And the last group of lower neural functions I like to call autonomic, the autonomic functions. Autonomic. And the autonomic functions of the nervous system usually do not require the involvement of consciousness. You can think of them as autonomous functions. They kind of work on their own. And these involve control of different cell types, including certain types of muscle cells called smooth muscle and cardiac muscle that are different than skeletal muscle, and also the control of some gland cells that produce hormones. All of these cells are involved in many important physical functions of the body, things like circulation of the blood and digestion of food. So those are the categories I think of inside the other category of the lower neural functions. And then inside the category I like to call higher neural functions, which you could also call the more complex neural functions, or some people think of these as the more mental functions that the nervous system performs. And the higher neural functions are not performed by both many parts of the central and the peripheral nervous system. The higher functions are primarily performed by the central nervous system, and in particular parts of the brain are really responsible for the higher neural functions. And I also like to divide these up into three big categories. The first one I call cognition. Cognition. And I think of this as kind of the thinking type of activities that the brain does. Things such as reasoning and learning, memory and language, and what are called the executive functions, which involve controlling the other cognitive functions and behavior to achieve goals. The next big category of higher neural functions I think of as the emotional functions. So the emotions. And these are of course the more feeling types of activities carried out by the brain. There are of course both positive and negative emotions and these play a major role in a person's experience of their life and in their behaviors. And the last category of function is consciousness. Consciousness. And consciousness is really hard to define. People have been trying to define this word for a long time, but I think of it as involving having an awareness of one's identity and experiences and having control of one's behavior. So obviously there's a lot more to all of these categories, and in a lot of ways you can organize the different functions of the nervous system any way you want, but I find this system is helpful to me when I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with a patient who's having a neurological syndrome. If I can try to figure out which categories of functions are involved, that often helps me a lot to figure out where the lesion might be. And specifically to look for these signs, these things we can find on examination, there is a specialized examination for the nervous system called the neurological examination. And clinicians perform that to assess the different neural functions at that moment in time.